Mary Wilson is from Brooklyn, New York. She grew up in a Victorian brownstone in Brooklyn Heights, lived in San Francisco, Chicago, Prague, and now again lives in Brooklyn with her husband, cartoonist Josh Newfield, and their daughter. She has been a Wallace Stegner Fellow at Stanford, a Fine Arts Work Center Fellow in Provincetown, Massachusetts, and she's received a residency from the Corporation of Yaddo. Her fiction has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and appeared in literary journals such as Agni, Oxford American, and Slice. Her novel, Girl Through Glass, was nominated for the Center for Fiction Debut Novel Prize and called out by publications from BuzzFeed to Glamour to Bustle to Refinery29 for being a notable book of 2016. And she is here with us to share uh, some of the story uh, about her book, Girl Through Glass. Please help me welcome Sari Wilson. I just I put my hand. That would be great. All right, welcome. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. Um, that was s such a wonderful introduction, and um, that reading at Harvard Bookstore when my book first came out last year was really, really special. One, um, I just feel really privileged and really honored to be here. You obviously have a really special community getting to know Cheryl a bit through my cousin Ellen and um, another woman, Dot Walsh, some of you may know too. Just, um, I feel like I'm learning um, from writing this book and I'm learning by connecting with people, having it out there in the world. For me, this book was a very internal process. I spent 10 years writing it. Um, and sitting in a room alone. <laughs> and so to be part of a larger community and talking about it and, and having it be a presence in the world has really been um, just a, such a privilege. So thank you for, for coming and hearing me. I think we, we're, okay. I just need to put this down. <laughs> Um, okay, so I actually prepared a little slideshow <laughs> for visual aids. I thought it might be interesting because this book began when I moved back to New York City in 2001. I had grown up in Brooklyn in the 1970s and 1980s, and then I left um, and I said, I'm never going back to New York. Uh. I got out of New York. I, I lived in, uh, I went to college in Ohio. I lived in Chicago. I lived in San Francisco. And, but I lived in Provincetown for a year. Um, but life brought me back to New York and actually to Brooklyn. And when I got back, I encountered a world, a city that had really like almost no resemblance to the New York and the Brooklyn that I remembered. And so I had to kind of confront the fact that my childhood belonged to a lost world. And that's what got me going um, on this book project, which I, in the beginning, didn't know was going to be a novel. So as I wrote, I looked at pictures um, of my childhood and of Brooklyn from the 1970s and New York from the 1970s. So I. I put together some of those images that were helpful to me um, to set the scene. Can we have the next slide, please? I have it? Oh, OK. Let's see. Oh. Oh, I do. Yes, I do. OK. <laughs> Tech. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, this is um, down under the Manhattan Bridge. If some of you know New York, uh, Brooklyn, it was called Dum It's still called Dumbo, but when I was growing up, you know, it's an, it's a it was a place that you you didn't go. It was dangerous. It had been factory uh, factories and warehouses and shipping. Um, center up until I don't even know when, but in the 1970s it was mostly deserted and it, you just didn't go down under the Manhattan Bridge. But of course we did. And 
what I love about this picture is it just conveys the sense of these um, urban spaces that were kind of in between, and that was what I remember from the city I grew up in, these spaces that were empty, you could get lost in them, there was a danger there, but there was also a kind of freedom. Uh, iconic, iconic image, summer, Brooklyn, actually this isn't Brooklyn, I don't think, but fire hydrants without their, you know, decapitated fire hydrants. <sighs> remember this, really remember this, it was great. So this is David Berkowitz, um, otherwise known as Son of Sam. He was a, a serial killer. <laughs> Um, he terrorized New York City in the summer of 1977 when my novel opens. I don't really remember, the, I was nine, and I, I don't really remember this, but I so remember that summer um, of heat and, 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 and sort of, you know, fear. And then that was also the summer of the blackout. Um, uh, Famously, I'm sure you all remember this, and I, I, that is etched in my childhood memory. I rem so I lived in Brooklyn, right on the edge of Manhattan, um, right across the river from Manhattan in Brooklyn Heights. And I remember going out to the promenade where we looked across into Manhattan, and, there was, and it was dark. There were no lights. It was like looking into the void. And it was this existential moment for, for me as a nine-year-old. Manhattan was the center of my world, of my existence. I, I was a Brooklyn girl, and in those days, being a Brooklyn girl meant being outside of the center. You know, Manhattan was the center. And we looked to Manhattan, and it was gone. And this uh, very sad story um, that has come into the news again recently um, they think they found his killer, mentally ill man. Anyway, this sign was everywhere um, when I was a child, all over the city. It was the most, the one that we remember most, but there were many lost children, missing children signs, and, you know, this was the city that we wandered. We were told um, not to get in cars with people we didn't know, and, uh, you know, there, if there were people, in, men in, in trench coats, <laughs> um, we should you know, run, and I mean, there was just, it was just a really different time, but at the same time, we had a lot more freedom. I, it's hard to understand now, but we were really let to, to you know, roam on our own. And that's Manhattan from 1977. We have the, the World Trade Center, Twin Towers, which obviously that's, adds another layer. Um, when I moved back to New York City, it was 11 months before 9-11. So again, going back into this book and back into my childhood memories was, was also about, you know, thinking about this, this city that had raised me in a sense and that I was returning to and what it all meant. And this is Carnegie Hall where I started taking ballet. Um, we had a little ballet studio there on the seventh floor and, and I loved it. I loved it so much. And this was the Russian tea room around the corner, which we occasionally would get to go to, and for me symbolized all the glamour of ballet in the 1970s. And this was the Met, this is the Met, and my parents, because I had fallen in love with ballet, they bought um, me season tickets to ABT, and we got to go, and I got to sit in the red velvet seats, and um, there were these you know, chandeliers, and um, for me as a child, it, this was the most magical place. It was like the palace, you know, the palace where the, the, the princes and the princesses and the kings and the queens lived. I just love those chandeliers. Yes. I still love them. And here's Mikhail Baryshnikov, who was my great heartthrob, and uh, he defected in 1975, I think. Um, I saw he, him dance with Gelsey Kirkland, 
probably around then, and I think that was the beginning of my infatuation with ballet and and um, and all things Russian. And here they are, it's Giselle and oh my gosh, what's his name? To the the, the prince, Giselle. Okay, I'll, it'll come to me, Albrecht. And here's Gelsie Kirkland from Vogue at the time. How many of you remember Gelsie Kirkland? Yeah, yeah. So she was, to me, also the epitome of, of beauty and, and femininity. And um, unfortunately, she was very extremely troubled and had eating disorders. So we all took her as a model. <laughs> um, and George Balanchine, who was our great god. Um, who oversaw ballet at the time and was really like, like um, his aesthetics determined everything about our world. I just love this photo um, still from uh, Turning Point, Alexandra Danilova, who had danced with um, Balanchine back in Russia before the revolution and had followed him uh, and then ended up, when they were expatriates and ended up in the um, teaching at the School of American Ballet. And I love this photo because this is an adult ballet class from the 1970s when, and, and what you can see here is that everybody at that time wanted to be a ballet dancer. You know, it wasn't just us little girls, um, but it was kind of sweeping, it just swept the nation as a pastime and the, you know, the glamour of it was connected with the Cold War and there was just so much. It was really a moment and, and I just love her, you know, her, the, the pride and the, the, the work that goes into ballet. And then this is the last slide. This is where we come to 11-year-old um, girls dancing in Carnegie Hall and you know, consumed by this sort of dream and this moment in time, um, this ideal of beauty and of nobility that was sort of going to save us from the ruptures of 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 the of the city, of the moment, of broken homes, of missing children, of urban decay, and um, I think that's what we were finding there. And I am actually one of these girls. The photo was taken by my dad. That was my best friend, Susanna. Her dad was um, Blake Carrington on Dynasty. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so I hope that sort of sets the scene and gives you a little bit of a window into, into my, my novel. Um, taking a step back, um, the Girl Through Glass is a literary mystery. That's how, what I'm thinking, that's how I call it. That's the way I think of it. Uh, and it follows an 11-year-old girl named Mira and her coming of age in the elite world of professional ballet. It is also a, mo a modern day mystery about a dance history professor named Kate who gets a mysterious letter from her past and sends her kind of hurling back in time to the traumas of her childhood. And I wanted to just jump in to read you a little bit of the opening. Ghosts. Chapter 1, July 1977. The garbage bags pile high on the sidewalks. The city shudders and heaves under the heat. The newspapers are filled with accounts of people being shot at night in darkened cars. Pride at New York City having its very own serial killer competes with the fear of going out after dark. At bus stops, children wearing keys around their necks, latchkey kids, they are called, wait alone. There is an infestation of blue bottle flies whose bug out eyes see everything. They are poisoned to death in a citywide public health campaign, but barrelfuls of pigeons die too, and their rotting corpses have to be stepped over while crossing the streets. 
The sprinkler systems in the city parks break and due to lack of funding go unrepaired. Throughout Brooklyn, the fire hydrants are decapitated and a barrage of water spouts forth. The children splash in the gutters with the pigeon corpses and dried popsicle sticks and Twinkie wrappers, while the grown-ups stumble around cursing and trying to drag them out. Then there is the day in July when the lights go out. Block after block blinks off. Fans and air conditioners stall. Under the purple haze, people gather on street corners, in hallways and in parks around battery-powered boomboxes, a citywide blackout. Thousands of ladybugs' eggs hatch in the Brooklyn Botanic Garden's suddenly warm storage freezer. In the days afterwards, they blanket Brooklyn's parks and apartment windowsills. Then come the reports of looting and up in the Bronx of fierce fires in abandoned buildings. The people lock their doors and swear at the heat and pray for their city. The grown-ups are busy with the untenable state of their lives. Perhaps they feel relief at the darkness. It is the children who stand and watch their city extinguished like a dying flame. When the ladybugs die, they fall to the grass, the floor, they crunch underfoot, they choke up vacuum cleaners. When the cool air comes, their husks are blown under piles of leaves, and unheralded casualties of the ever-changing season begin their descent into the earth. Inside the world of asphalt and concrete, there is another world. Things that look like they are made by someone's hands. Gross grain ribbons and spiderweb thin hairnets and soft leather slippers. Down the crumbling school corridors and cracked sidewalks, these delicate things can be carried like talismans in jeans pockets or book bags. In this other world, the girls do not wear tight jeans, scuffed keds, or stiff pleated skirts that come in cellophane wrappers. Instead, they wear tights that range in color from a soft pink to a bright salmon. They wear cap sleeve or tank top black leotards with bands of two-ply elastic around their waists. They wear ballet slippers, capizios, which are a tawny russet pink with soles that crack in the middle of the arch, making it look like their point is better than it is or orange-pink freeds, which are made in England and have an aura of exoticness. The poor or oblivious girls wear selvas, which are a flat pink that looks both prissy and cheap. These girls, known to each other as bunheads, wear their hair braided or twisted and wrapped around to form a solid nub held in place with bobby pins and a hairnet. As bunheads, they each own a few prized hairnets of human hair so soft and fine that they hold their breath while handling them. They pull out the bobby pins carefully, fold the nets into small balls of fur, and slip them back into their paper pouches. The mothers keep these pouches in their purse pockets, so expensive are they. Meanwhile, their nylon hair nets from Woolworths shift around at the bottom of the girls' book bags while they're in the other world catching on pens, the corners of books. The girls turn them round and round, searching for an unripped section. So that was the first that I read. Um, sorry, that was the first that I wrote <laughs> for this book. I just, uh, during a writing session, I wrote that out. And then I tried to um, actually write a memoir um, for many years, it, it, it failed. It never took off. And I, um, at a certain point, I began getting uh, a voice. I did some interviews with girls I had danced with, and I got a voice um, of another a girl who wasn't me. Her name is Mira, and she, she has red hair. That's what I'm going to say about Mira. And she... Um, she ends up going places that I never went uh, in this book. I'm going to just read, I have just a few more minutes, so I'm just going to read a tiny bit of Mira's voice and then a teeny tiny bit of um, Kate's voice as well. Um. My Mira is not coming to me. 
Here, come to me. Okay, well, here's, here's the scene I really want to read, but I'm just going to read. Um, she's following a man. This, is, this is, gets really complicated. You're going to have to read the book to find out about this. She's following a man who's been watching her. The clouds break and a bank of lighter sky appears. It's a luminous, spooky white. 57th Street's handsome facades briefly light up as she co trails his coat down the middle of the sidewalk. Now the city comes alive around her. Shoes click by, high heels, loafers with tassels, some made of the shiny skin of an alligator. Legs and pants, checkered, bell-bottomed, brushing the concrete as they go. Skirts, denim, and sleek leather. Shopping bags swing, folded umbrellas tick by, faces covered by sunglasses, eyes drip with makeup, mouths open in laughter. A cup wrapped in folded cardboard jumps in front of her. It's attached to a man whose eyes are raised upward an unseeing blue. She feels a calmness settle over her, the power of her anonymity. She pushes back past the cardboard cup, past this broken man. The little man she's following rounds the corner at Bergdorf's and she follows him up to Fifth Avenue to the pillared gates of Central Park. There she loses sight of him in the crowd. She pauses, but not for long. He's there, standing in front of her. He holds an oversized black umbrella above his head despite the fact that it's not raining anymore. He smiles broadly as if he has just said bingo or lotto or connect four or any of the words that mean I win, you lose. Only she doesn't feel like she has lost. She feels like she too has won a prize. Are you following me, he says. <sighs> okay, there's just so much here. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know what? I'm going to give you guys a break. I'm just going to leave it there. I'm going to leave it there. And um, I'm going to be doing another event later today, so I'm going to talk more about the book and do some more reading. I'll read, um, I'll read from the, the Kate section as well at, at that reading. But thank you so much for having me, Cheryl. Thank you um, um, to Ellen and everybody who's made this possible for me to come and my kind of faulty GPS as well. <laughs> And this is the impossible love song. I had a friend who told me the other day It's like I dance with two left feet that only get in my own way she said, why are the only apples of your eye? The only apples that will never fall from that branch away up high. Well, if there's one thing you should know about me, I only fall in love with impossible people, it seems. For example, if you're all mine except for the fact that you wear a ring If you're a player who refuses to commit but loves to hook up and swing If it turns out you're only interested in dating men Or if we met on an airplane never to cross paths again if so, give me a call. I'll surely fall head over heels for you. My impossible love, impossible love, impossible. Ooh. My impossible love, impossible love, impossible. It only gets better from here. If you're a pirate who sails the seven seas both day and night, or a hermit who will never step outside into daylight. If you're sick with some contagious, exotic, infectious disease in quarantine, or if you're on the run from the law, no problem. Stay as long as you please. If so, give me a call. I'll surely fall head over heels for you. My impossible love. Impossible love, impossible, ooh, 
my impossible love, impossible love, impossible. Now if you're a local friend who likes me and actually thinks I'm great, hmm, or for that matter, someone who actually lives in the same state, no way. But do you live on the International Space Station? Much better. Or are you a member of an isolated tropical island nation? Oh, if so, give me a call. I'll surely fall head over heels for you. My impossible love, impossible love, impossible. Ooh, my impossible love. Impossible love, impossible. Well, if there's one thing you should know about me, I only fall in love with impossible people, it seems. Oh, my impossible love.